Okay, well, I thought this time that I would actually cover some of the biblical stories. <laughs> so, and hopefully a number of them. Um, as I said last time, I'm, I'm going to go through this, well, as fast as I am able to. I want to do it as complete a job as possible. And I guess we'll start. So last week, I, I talked to you about a line in the New Testament that was from John, and it was a line that was designed to parallel the opening of Genesis. And it's, it's, a, it's a really important line, and I thought I would re-emphasize it. Because the Bible is a book that's been written forward and backwards in time. And there's this strange idea that um, Christ was the same factor or force that God used at the beginning of time to speak habitable order into being. And that's a very, very strange idea. You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not something that can be just easily dismissed as superstition, partly because it's so strange. It's, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't even fit the definition of like a superstitious belief. It's, it's a dreamlike belief in some... Anyways, what, what it's, it seems to me is the idea that, that God used the word to to extract order out of habitable order out of chaos at the beginning of time, which is roughly the right way of thinking about it, seems to me deeply allied with the idea that what it is that we do as human beings is, is encounter something like a formless and potential chaos. And so the notion is, is that there's a father, and that's the structure, and there's a son that's transcendent, that characterizes consciousness itself, and that it's the son, the, the speaking of the son, that is the active principle that turns chaos into order. And God, that's such a sophisticated idea. The first chapters of Genesis, which is a staggering idea, you know, and, and certainly not one that's likely that human beings were made in the image of God, both male and female were made in the image of God. And that's, of course, a very difficult thing to understand, partly because the God that's referred to in, the, in those chapters has a kind of polytheistic element, um, although, it, it's an element that's moving rapidly towards a unified monotheism. But it's not also obvious to me why people would come up with that concept. Because I don't really think that when we think about each other, we immediately think godlike. You know, the, the notion that every single human being, regardless of their peculiarities and strangenesses and sins and crimes and all of that, has something divine in them that needs to be regarded with respect and that plays an integral role at least an, analog an analogous role in the creation of habitable order out of chaos. That's a magnificent, remarkable, crazy idea. And yet, we developed it, and I do firmly believe that it sits at the base of our legal system. I, so that's the sort of idea, is that there's this, this God of tradition and structure. That's, that's God the Father, who uses the Son, which is more of an active force, and... and, and Primarily something that's verbal, which I also think is extremely interesting because it's associated not with thought precisely, but with speech. And I think the reason for that is, is that there's something to speech that's more than mere thought. And I think part of the reason for that is that speech is a public utterance. And at least in, in principle, speech is something that's shaped by the existence of, of, everywhere, of everyone else, at least across time. Because when you speak, you, you, your speech is is put forward in the world as a causal element, and it's also subject to criticism and, and, uh, and cooperation and, and mutual shaping. And so th there's an idea here, too, that speech is that, that the cognitive processes that bring habitable reality out of, out of uninhabitable chaos have this collective and public element, which, which is part of the reason, by the way, that I'm an advocate of free speech, let's say, above all, because God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day and the darkness he called night. And again, again the fact that things are named is also very important. So you see this later with Adam, because God gives Adam the job of naming all the animals, and it's sort of like the animals don't actually exist in some sense till they're named. And that's, that's another indication of the authors of the Bible's attempt to come to terms with the fact that our cognitive faculties and our ability to speak 
have something to do with the way that we cast chaotic potential into actuality, right? Because we can't, we can't really get a grip on something before we have a name for it, which is why, for example, you all have names, and everything that you encounter has to have a name, because before it has a name, it's just kind of part of the blurry background, it's something like that. And you could say it exists before it has a name, but, and that's true, but it's also true that it doesn't exist before it has a name. Because as soon as you give something a name, its nature changes, and you've transformed it into something that's not so much mere potential anymore, but it's at least on its way to being actuality. It's on its way to being a tool. And so the, the act of naming is repeated continually in the first chapters of the Bible, and the reason for that is this continued emphasis on the importance of consciousness and conscious articulation and speech in the 30s before I knew much about him, but one of the things that Heidegger said was that the fundamental element of human being, of human phenomenology, was care. He said that that's the basic essence of your being, is that you care about things. You know, and, that, and that's that either negatively or positively, right? You, to not care about something or to hate it is still to be involved in care. And so, even if the cosmos itself is is neutral with regards to our existence, we're not, and we're the only things that we know of that are conscious, and so, well, we might as well go with that, and there's no reason. See, I can't help but think that the constant attempts by people to trivialize the nature of their own consciousness has a, has a dark side. I'm a, I'm a psychoanalyst, and so I always think that way. It's like, well, first of all, if, you're, if you as a being don't matter, then you don't have to do anything. It's a great justification for total lack of responsibility, and that that really twigs something for me, because, you know, people who are bent, let's say, or vengeful, or angry, are always looking for a reason why they don't have to be responsible for anything. Plus, it's a lot easier. And so, the notion that consciousness is trivial immediately allows you to wander down that path. And so, I'm skeptical of those claims, and I also think that there's a deep hatred of humanity that underlies those claims as well. And for security and utopia. We're adapted for a certain amount of security because, you know, we are vulnerable, but mostly we want to have one foot out where we don't know what the hell is going on because that's where you're alert and alive and tense and with it. And, and you know, I think, I believe this, and I believe it actually has something to do with the hemispheric structure of, your, of, your, of the physiology of your brain, is because the right hemisphere looks roughly adapted to what you don't know, and the left hemisphere, and this is a very, this is an oversimplification, but a useful one, is adapted to the world that you do know, and the right place for you to be is halfway between them. Because that, and you can tell that, that's what's so cool, and, and this tells you that this is actually reality that's manifesting itself to you. You know that sense of active engagement you have in the world when things are working well for you, you know, where you're, where you should be at the right time. You're alert, and on top of things, and engaged, and you don't have much of a sense of time, and the sense of the tragedy of life sort of recedes, and that's when you're... That's when you've got one foot when it's, where it's secure and one foot out in the unknown. Paradise on earth, it's something like it. Because you are in the right place at the right time when that is happening. Subject to certain, what would you say, restrictions that, that we can talk about later. Well, that's what this guy's doing. And, and that's, I would say, akin to the action that God is taking when he's transforming the chaos of potential into habitable being. And it's the sort of thing that human beings are supposed to act out notion that it was good, well, even if you don't believe that, and, you know, because maybe it's not as good as it could be, I would say it's incumbent on you, as someone who participates in the process of, of furthering creation, to act as if it could be good, at least, and to further that with, with all of your efforts, partly because what the hell else do you have to do that could possibly be better than that, that could possibly justify your existence more than that, and you know perfectly well if you, if, you, if you have any sense at all, if you think clearly about it at all, is that that's what you want to see in everyone else. You know, it's, you're, you're desperate and maybe you're cynical and now and then someone appears that acts at least momentarily like a light in the darkness and that lifts your spirit up and gives you a little bit of hope and maybe helps you continue on. It's, well, that's obviously a call to being. It, it's, a, it's a statement from your own soul that says, well, there's something about that that's how you should be. And maybe then, well, we get a chance to, to participate in what is good. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of heavens to give light on the earth 
to rule over the day and over the night. And so there's an idea of sovereignty there too, right? That, that, that there's an analogy between the ruler and the, and the heavenly bodies that, that, light up the, that light up the darkness, essentially. And that's a really interesting idea too, because it took us a long time to come to terms with, as I mentioned last week, to come to terms with the idea of sovereignty itself and to decide what constituted valid power. And it's not power. It's not power. It's authority and competence and not power. It's not dominance either. It's more sophisticated than that because the people that you want to rule aren't people who have power. Because power just means I can hurt you and you can't hurt me back. That's, that's, not, that, that's not what you need from a ruler, even though it devolves into that from time to time. What you want is the kind of wisdom that illuminates the darkness and to associate the sovereign with the with the heavenly kings of the light is a perfectly reasonable thing to do from a metaphoric perspective and that's an ancient, ancient idea, you know, and another example of how we're grounded in a dream and God set them in the expanse of heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good another emphasis on the fact that it was better that there was something than nothing and you know, maybe you could Maybe you could consider that the declaration of the cosmos is something like, well, it's better that there's something than nothing. And, well, how do you know that? And I guess the answer to that is that there's something instead of nothing. And I know that that's not proof, but, but it's still a remarkable fact that it happens to be the case. And no one does know why that is. And so maybe we should go along with it and see what we can do with it, you know, and see how we could make it better. Because we certainly could if we were, if we were really committed to it. And, we shook our resentment and our, our anger and our hatred and I know there's reason for all of that because people do suffer terribly but you know, God only knows what being could be like if we all contributed, it, contributed to it to the best of our ability God only knows what we could conquer and what sort of magnificent cities we could produce and what things we could, we could eradicate from, from, from the suffering of the world morning, the fifth day and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping beasts, creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. Kind, right? That's kin, right? And to be kind is to treat others as if they're your kin. And so, according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. That's something to do with... It, well, it has something to do, and this is for sure, with the, with the voluntary acceptance of mortality. Because, of course, that's the poisoned apple, right? The fact that everybody looks forward into the future to know that you're finite and so is everything that you love. And it's very difficult for that not to poison your existence. And, well, there's no getting out of it, as far as we can tell, but there might be something like switching your attitude to it. And you could say, well, that's the price you pay for being. And the heroic thing to do is to accept that and not even to accept it grudgingly. To say, all right, I'm going to go along with that. I'm going to accept that. And I'm going to act nonetheless as if being is good. And then I'm going to see how things turn out. It's something like that. And God saw that it was good. And so it's an act of courage. right? There's, a, there's, a, there's an act of courage that's associated with that transformation of attitude. And even with regards to the notion that the world is good. It's a courageous attitude. Especially given that there's so much evidence that makes that conclusion difficult to continually draw. But the alternative seems to me to be far worse.